Well, welcome to our webinar highlighting processor to processor, which we like to call P2P. You may have seen an article on AOCS volunteers in this month's inform. P2P is an opportunity for AOCS members to impact food security by helping African processors efficiently scale nutrition in a one-on-one -on -one relationship. P2P is a pilot program, the result of a collaboration between AOCS, the Soybean Innovation Lab, and Cultivating New Frontiers in Africa. P2P scales up impact. We're helping large processors efficiently and effectively produce nutritious food, mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we will have sp five speakers today, including two AOCS member volunteers who have recently returned from Malawi and Mozambique. The last presentation will detail the program and how you can get involved. Any questions for our presenters can be put into the Q&A section of your control panel. Let me just briefly go over who's going to present. Myself, Dr. Juan Andrade from University of Florida, Rich Barton, an AOCS volunteer, Brent German, an AOCS volunteer, and Marianta Iliata. She is the director of this program for CNFA. So without further ado, let's get started. My name is Annette Donnelly. I am an AOCS member and the program manager for P2P at the Soybean Innovation Lab, which is based at the University of Illinois here in Champaign. My background is in industry and development. I've spent 20 years working in emerging markets and conflict and post-conflict countries to help vulnerable populations find a better future. My goal today is to introduce the Soybean Innovation Lab and our partnership with AOCS and CNFA. I will talk about our combined mission and approach as well as the focus of the Soybean Innovation Lab's nutrition team. Finally, I will emphasize the reasoning behind this collaborative approach to improve the operations and capability with agroprocessors in Sub-Saharan Africa, especially those focused on soybean. Uh, SIL, Soybean Innovation Lab, is a USAID Feed the Future Innovation Lab. There are 25 innovation labs in the US, all at land-grant universities. Each one has a specific focus. We are focused on soybean and these in Sub-Saharan Africa and the soybean value chain. Um, we bring evidence-based thinking and uh, pragmatic applied research to the soybean value chain in Africa. So one thing that, uh, that we're focused on is the zero hunger goal for 2030. At the moment, we are not on track. We are also not on track to meet the interim goal of reducing stunting by 40% by 2025. Why this matters is that stunting is a manifestation of long-term food insecurity. Stunting happens in, uh, is measured in children under five. It retards linear and physical growth because of under, undernutrition, but it, lasts, it can last a lifetime. So as mentioned, stunting is retarded linear and cognitive growth, can last a lifetime. Recent research has found that animal protein uh, in school lunches can start to reverse the cognitive effects of stunting. Animal protein, however, in Africa is very expensive and most families can't afford it, particularly those that would have been affected by undernutrition. We think soybean may be a, um, have high enough protein that it can also reverse the cognitive effects of stunting. And that's another reason why it's so important that we work with processors to bring nutritious, high protein foods that are inexpensive to market. So why processor to processor? So if there is a choke point in the value chain in, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa with processors. They cannot get enough raw materials because processing, or excuse me, because soybean is relatively new in Africa and it's grown by smallholder farmers and they are in an exorbitantly expensive context. Electricity, infrastructure, um, the cost of capital, squelches innovation. And so if we can help processors become more efficient, they can innovate better and bring more food into the market. Bringing food into the market for children, vulnerable children, it, that's my passion. So why you? 
I'd like to tell AOCS members at conferences that uh, they have an opportunity to change the world and go on safari. AOCS members are highly skilled, uniquely experienced in the oil seed and alternative protein space. Your skills can change operations for a processor that has a significant market power. As an example, one of the volunteers you heard from today um, worked with a processor that has over a 40% share in their national market. The processors you work with can make the change that we all want to see, but they need your help. You may be wondering where is the evidence for the conclusions I'm drawing? Well, we surveyed processors across Sub-Saharan Africa. Their top answer, well, what kept them up at night was finding raw, enough raw materials. The other answers, uh, the other top four were about uh, better operating procedures and cost of capital. So if we can bring expertise to processors and help them do what they do more efficiently, we can alleviate some of these headaches and enable processors to further innovate and invest rather than worrying about where they're gonna find adequate working capital. Okay, so we went to uh, Western Kenya uh, working with Professor Ruth Onyengo, who is an, at the African Food Prize winner. Um, and we wanted to know, will the kids eat soy enhanced foods? Will they like it? What will be the cost? And what we found out was um, surprising to us. First, 972 kids in a sensory, they loved soy enhanced foods. So we know they'll eat it. We compared regular staple foods with staple foods that had soy. What we found was with the soy enhanced soy chunks, which is soy pro texturized soy protein, that um, the protein boosted was boosted to 65% of the daily requirement for five to seven year olds, over 50% for um, seven to 10 year olds. We also found, and we loved this, was that the cost per serving went up by 1.92 shillings per kid, which is under a penny. So let me just repeat that. For under a penny, we can boost the protein for under a penny per kid per day, we can boost the protein to cover almost half or more than half of daily uh, recommended protein. And then for my last slide, we wanted to, uh, wanted to share the enthusiasm that USAID also has for this project. Uh, Mike Michener came to the annual meeting in Atlanta. He is a gentleman in a yellow tie. Um, he came to talk about P2P to, to you, AOCS members. You might also recognize Keshen Liu, who collaborates with us. Uh, next to Keshen is Juan Andrade. There's Mike in the middle. There's myself, Marietta Eliata, and our doctoral student at the time, who was also your student leader, AJ Golkirpik. And she is now Dr. Golkirpik. Congratulations, AJ. And um, with that, I will turn it over to Juan Andrade. All right, so our next speaker is Juan Andrade. Juan is an AOCS member and an associate professor of global food and nutrition at the University of Florida in Gainesville. One second, Juan's long-term goal uh, is to develop sustainable strategies that can be used to deliver adequate nutrition, especially quality protein and micronutrients to residents of low resource countries. Juan is also the principal investigator for the Soybean Innovation Labs nutrition team and my boss, which makes him perfect in every way. Juan, take it away. Well, thank you for the kind introduction, Annette. Annette, can anybody hear me? So 100%. Sounds okay. great. Excellent. Well, welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, we want to take a little bit of time just to emphasize a few points, but this is about members helping processors in Africa. And uh, as much as I want to keep repeating this, we, we need your help, we need your support, and yes, you can make a difference. So the first point I want to make, uh, it's on a, this, the needs that are still out there. We have, after COVID-19 hit us, we, we brought more uh, hungry folks, uh, more food insecurity to the world, to more than 150 million folks uh, uh, facing food insecurity. And one thing that the State of uh, Food and Agriculture uh, from the FAO's uh, report, the SOFIE report 2022, commented on this, that about 3.1 billion uh, people cannot access a healthy diet. And before starting a controversy, what a healthy diet is, is something that we have been 
as a, as a nutritionist we have been discussing uh, for many many decades is a diet that is uh, contains diverse uh, foods which means diversity of nutrients this is safe and it provides the levels of energy calories nutrients appropriate for your age sex uh, any disease status and physical activity so nothing beyond the ordinary but these healthy diet is is not accessible for many many people almost half of the world population Seal Nutrition argues that for these diets to be adaptable and adoptable by population, they must be desirable, inexpensive, nutrient-dense, environmentally and culturally responsive, and safe. And this is what we call our dying's paradigm for uh, enhancing interventions that can reach populations, vulnerable groups in, in many countries. We also argue that soybeans fits the definition of uh, being part of food in a healthy diet. And it has been part of a healthy diet in many, many other countries, but in Sub-Saharan Africa, it remains a challenge. It is because transformation is pretty much needed for soybeans. Soybeans are the most transformed, most processed beans in the world. And as Annette mentioned before, one of the largest challenges is, is still there is to access these raw materials and that's why the soybean innovation lab is present in many countries in sub-saharan africa to start that supply chain but also we need innovation we need what you know uh, what the last uh, five decades of innovation had brought up soybeans into interesting products and formulas that we we benefit in the west and we have to bring it to africa and they have to meet these dines criteria. we argue that processors are these link between these uh, new raw materials that can be included into formulas to make them more nutritious without jeopardizing cost, without jeopardizing taste that populations are seeking. Um, we also argue that nutrition can reach those specific niche markets such as institutional feeding programs such as schools or for complementary feeding needs, bringing good quality prote protein to complement staple diets that are provided in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. The last point I'm going to make is one example of how this could work out. And I cannot stress this. We as AOCS understand how to play, how to manipulate soybeans to bring the best of it for animal feed or for human nutrition. And one of the big challenges, for example, that we have in sub-Saharan Africa is that we don't have the, the ability to process soybeans fully. For example, we have seen that in sub-Saharan Africa, mechanical expellers are uh, predominant more so than solving extraction of soybeans. This renders a cake that might be very difficult to manipulate beyond animal feed. But we argue that through the innovation lab and through the uh, skill set that we have in our AOCS membership, we might be able, as we have shown, convert that uh, product that might not have a, a, the flexibility to enter uh, a human food supply into a product that might be amenable to incorporation into diets, such as we have shown with soy protein concentrate. And this is the work we have done with uh, Dr. Liu. So I think there's opportunity. I, I kind of emphasize again, the, the partic your participation can be impactful and can support these uh, transformation of soybeans and of course, of other commodities that we uh, sorely need to enter the food supply to address these big nutrition gaps as we have seen in Sub-Saharan Africa. With that, I wanna say thank you to the team and I hope the conversation with the members, uh, if anything, inspire you to participate in this program. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Always insightful. I think that uh, the Dines criteria is a great conversation when considering foods to bring to the market in Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you for sharing that. Um, are there any, I don't have any other immediate questions. So with that, let me introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker today is Rich Barton. He is an AOCS member and a recent volunteer to Mozambique under the P2P pilot. Rich has long experience with oilseed extraction and is now a consultant and owner president of N. Hunt Moore and Associates. 
Rich brings a background in process design, project management, and energy optimization studies to processors. He also brings deep humanitarian convictions and is just one heck of a nice guy. All right, Rich, take it away. Rich, you're muted. Yeah, no, I, thank you, Annette. I was, I'm slow, okay? I'm old, Annette. Give me a, give me a break here. So, uh, good, uh, good day, everybody. I appreciate you joining the uh, webinar and. Uh, I would like to share my experience that I had in Mozambique. The uh, first question that AOCS asked me to uh, address in this webinar is why did I volunteer for uh, P2P? Actually, I received an email from uh, the Farmer to Farmer program about two years ago, but I'm not a farmer. I'm the son of a farmer, but I'm not a farmer. Uh, the program intrigued me because of its focus on addressing the needs in uh, Africa. And then the most important point is the next one. When Annette Donnelly approaches you, you better watch out because um, she is very convincing on uh, presenting the reasons why one should volunteer for P2P. Now, about my experience itself, CNFA held my hand. They made it possible that the volunteer, myself, could concentrate on the assignment. Uh, there are program specialists who provided uh, the pre-trip information, uh, and that always concludes with an inter introductory call with uh, Hannah Domini, Dominic, excuse me, um, who is very good at what she does and uh, just gives you air, all the information that you need uh, in order to feel comfortable entering uh, the country. Likewise, the end country managers reach out to the volunteer and assure that uh, they have an effortless entry into the country and a safe handoff to the processor. So my assignment, assignment was with JFS in Kwamba. The uh, scope of work as given to me uh, prior to my uh, Arrival was to advise JFS on how to incorporate a line of production for soy chunks. Now, uh, Dr. Andretti did not uh, specifically call out that particular uh, product, <clears throat> excuse me, but that is one of the methods as uh, being, uh, being used to introduce soy protein uh, into the population. Uh, I guess uh, Annette did allude uh, to that when she was talking about uh, the inclusion of soy protein in the diets. Um, basically, the soy chunks are can be a variety of versions of a soy protein concentrate with the uh, feedstock varying anywhere from just whole soybeans to expelled soybeans uh, to solvent extracted uh, soybeans. When I arrived, uh, the press plant that JFS had purchased was still undergoing commissioning. So because I did not want to interfere with the supplier of that press plant, the plant management asked me to give observations about it uh, from the sidelines, uh, but not to be directly involved uh, with the uh, commissioning process. The uh, plant management also asked me to analyze uh, a batch refinery that had recently been installed. And then uh, the longer I was there, they asked me to evaluate the prospect of bulk storage of soybeans, as well as to evaluate the prospect for a hexane extraction plant. And so uh, I performed all those services while I was there. And um, let me just, mentioned that uh, JFS uh, really impressed me with uh, with the, the uh, uh, management style that they used. Uh, it was very uh, proactive. It was uh, very uh, modern. Uh, my next assignment actually begins in less than one week. Um, next Wednesday, I will travel to Madagascar uh, to participate with the Agrivol plant there. And the uh, scope of work will be to help them improve the quality and the yields 
uh, with a newly installed expeller plant. Uh, if that assignment goes any way uh, similar to the one I had in Mozambique, then perhaps I will uh, address any other issues that they have. So let me talk briefly about my assignment by using these four pictures. Uh, I'm going to start with the one on the upper right hand that my cursor is circling right now. Um, that is the receiving area for uh, JFS. You can see the uh, bells of cotton stacked on the right-hand side and a pneumatic transfer system to go into their ginning plant. Um, in the background, which you cannot see, is where the, uh, the press plant is located. So now let me uh, draw your attention to the center picture on my slide, which uh, this is a picture of the press plant. Um, for example, components that they had uh, were a small stack conditioner, uh, the press itself. Uh, this is a holding tank um, for the oil after the foots had been removed. Uh, outside of the picture are uh, an oil filter press. And uh, downstream from, uh, from this conveyor uh, was a, uh, uh, another step to uh, help uh, bag the uh, cake which they made. Here on the left is a picture of cotton being grown in the bush. And uh, the interesting thing about um, this picture is uh, the plant manager had asked me if I wanted to go uh, you know, look at the cotton uh, being grown in the bush and how they uh, purchased the cotton in the bush. And I said, are there any dangerous animals in the bush? And actually, I was on a, uh, a uh, FaceTime call with my wife when I asked him that question. And he said, uh, he said, the only thing you have to worry about are spiders. Um, and then he indicated the, that even that was not a problem. But uh, that made my wife feel uh, good about uh, uh, my uh, trip out to the, uh, the bush. Uh, addressing the nutritional needs of, I think, perhaps many, unfortunately, in Africa. I, I draw your attention to the picture on the lower right-hand side of this slide. Notice that uh, the common footwear are just sandals, if even that. A lot of uh, the people in that part of the world just are barefooted. But I really want to draw your attention to this man's left foot. And what you'll see is that that foot is inverted. That man is not walking on the sole of his foot. He is walking on the top of his foot. And it just really, really touched my heart when I, uh, when I saw that. So uh, at this point, uh, I think I'm supposed to leave this slide up and uh, open the floor to uh, the chat or to, uh, to you, Annette. Well, I, there are a couple questions for you, Rich, and uh, thank you for sharing your picture. So the first question is, uh, what surprised you the most when you got to Mozambique? Well, uh, Mozambique itself as a country, I, I guess I was not totally surprised with um, the, uh, uh, not the climate, but the environmental setting. Uh, I had been to Africa once before in 2005. Um, so seeing the uh, the level of prosperity there compared to the level of prosperity in the United States, I, which there was a great disparity in that, that did not surprise me. Um, what did surprise me about JFS uh, itself is the level of sophistication that the company has. Uh, they deal with over 40,000 farmers there, and um, they have developed their own program uh, for uh, making sure that all transactions are secure and that um, all transactions are transparent. Uh, and their use of cell phones to do that and um, other technology um, amazed me. So that, that part of it, uh, you know, surprised me. Uh, and That's okay, honestly, the bush was not what I thought it would be. It was it was a lot it was a lot better experience than I thought it could be. 
<laughs> well, 40,000 farmers. So you impact the processor, you immediately impact all those livelihoods and not even counting what's going to get to market. So that's amazing. Thank you. One more question. Did your experience change your thoughts about volunteer opportunities? It, it did. I, again, I, I consider myself to have a, a humanitarian heart. I, uh, uh, and that, as you know, similar to you, my family is built um, not only on biological children, but also on adopted children, um, because there are just not enough parents in the world to go around and and help uh, children. Um, the The way that uh, this changed my volunteer experience um, was, um, I, I guess, I assumed that the participants would be uh, welcoming on me, but they were more than welcoming uh, for my presence there. Uh, I felt uh, that the participants that I, um, you know, worked with, uh, they respected where I was coming from. Um, they they challenged me, um, not only technically, but also I, I'm going to say personally. Uh, we, we shared stories of our lives together, and I did not really expect that. Uh, to be able to share that much of my story with them, as well as to learn their stories, their children, um, their needs in the world. Um, so that that's what really impacted me the most. That's awesome. And you're going to love Madagascar. I cannot so, wait. <laughs> so Rich, we're going to move on now to Brent. Brent German is also an AOCS member and is a technical consultant with over 30 years of management and engineering experience in the oil seeds industry. Like Rich, Brent brings a long list of skills and experience in the industry and currently provides plant project and operations support through Blind Corner Solutions. Brent, take it away. Yeah, maybe. We'll see about that. All right, everybody hear me? Anybody hear me? Sounds great, looks good. Okay. Uh, so Matt talked about me already, so we won't waste too much time on that. Uh, I did work for two of the big four, and since I've been working as a consultant, I've worked for a lot of smaller processors. And as part of that, I got to work with a lot of the industry experts. So it was interesting to go over there and see what they were working with, which in general was not any of the normal suppliers equipment that we're used to a uh, simple reason why i went i like to go to new places and help someone while i'm there uh, i've worked uh, in a different uh, venue with similar uh, places but none that are just flat out this this poor i mean the, the level of poverty in these places are just truly tremendous um so and maybe to get just a little bit better by going to help somebody. I, one of the things that surprised me when I got there was that the the companies that we were seeing, they're like companies everywhere else. So they are not particularly driven by helping to feed other people unless it's going to make them money somehow. So the people in the front lines, though, you know, the supervisors, uh, to a lesser extent, the plant managers, uh, but these guys, they, they work in an environment where they, they have no other resources. So they basically are self-taught and whatever problems they've had, they learned how to solve them on their own or learned how to shut the equipment off. Um, so it was good to be able to finally get through to those people. The discussion we had pre-visit were that uh, uh, really with the with the upper level management managers who didn't particularly understand the problem they're having at the plant level. Uh, things I do remind people to remember why you're going, uh, don't expect to have a, a first class treatment or, you know, so they fly coach going over there, which is not usually what you're going to see in a 15 hour flight, uh, out of the U S uh, flying for Cargill or, or Louis Dreyfus. Um, as far as experience getting there, uh, I thought CFNA just did a wonderful job keeping track of me. Uh, they wanted to know, you know, when I took off, when I landed, did I find my way to the hotel? Um, I lost my passport for a while, so they were completely unfazed by that. 
And uh, of course, I was, thought I was going to get to extend my vacation there for a while. Uh, but just just a lot of support um, around everything as far as the trip itself. So there were no issues with that. And for what's worth, because I've heard this from a number of people, that they won't don't want to travel out of the U.S. because it's unsafe. And I would remind you that for every place else in the world, when they look to travel to the United States, we are considered one of the most unsafe countries in the world. So something to think about. Uh, where I went was Malawi, and I'm from Kansas originally, and this is just about as far from Kansas as you can get and still be on this world. Uh, I was sent to go there to work on a soy chunks extruder. That's a picture of it on the right. So we couldn't get any real information on what they were doing or equipment we were going to be working on. Uh, for all, I thought to an extent I was walking in on a full-scale process ready to go. And what they were trying to do was make a new product to be able to market to the uh, uh, lower income people in the country. And they could not get it to run. Uh, one of the first questions I had is, what are soy chunks? And uh, Rich had uh, been around it, so we were able to talk through that and some other people, but I had never seen uh, what we were doing. It turned out it wasn't that big of a uh, change. It's basically an extruder um, and a cooler afterwards. And the problem they had, which we, we were allotted two weeks to work on this thing, it took about uh, uh, two and a half hours to work through what the problem was in the equipment. And about 30 minutes after that, they actually had it running. So it was like most problems in a plant. Uh, once you get there and, and look at it, it's uh, not that hard. Um, and they were very responsive. I mean, they have all their own in-house people right doing things. So, um, as far as getting the plant fixed, that was pretty easy, which was a bit unfortunate because I left about a week and a half with uh, uh, not much to work on as far as reasonable went. Um, again, plants very homegrown, they had no outside training. One of the people I worked with had been in the plant for seven years, another for 20. Uh, so they knew the plant inside and out. What they didn't know, um, uh, were of course the innovations or just other, you know, if they hadn't dreamed it up themselves, they, they just didn't have access to any other training. Um, so it's on this slide here. It was interesting to see something which I personally had never seen before. And again, I've been in places that were pretty darn poor, but the this is a meal loading operation uh, at the bottom uh, left. So these are guys in bare feet, uh, walking up a stack of meal to load the, the meal on the truck. Uh, beans came in the same way. Um, and it was, it was the, on the left here is a wood fired boiler. Uh, they also had a coal fired boiler, but they had the, uh, uh, the fireman at it still feeding the boiler by hand. Um, you know, make this work. And, and this is not an old plant. Uh, this particular boiler was installed in 2000 or 2003, I think. Other things we got to work on was a powdered milk factory while I was there. And that's this. And uh, what was interesting about this, the people working in this factory had literally never worked with milk before, including the guy that, that uh, had the dream of doing it, but he Saw an opportunity, was able to uh, find some money somewhere, and he he built a powdered milk plant. Uh, powdered milk is a pretty big thing there because they have very little refrigeration, so they can't store things for very long, right? Uh, the guy in the bottom, he's the yogurt agitator. So this, uh, when you make yogurt, it has to be agitated for two to four hours, depending on uh, which yeast to use, and that is the agitator. So he stood at that thing for four hours, stirring it by hand. I uh, worked with a woman uh, at a sweet potato bread factory, and her problem was that she had zero project management skills. So she had worked in a corporate uh, plant making bread, and she had a vision to uh, make it out of sweet potato, which has uh, very interesting nutritional properties. Um, but she had no idea how to run her project. So we was, in fact, we're still talking to her off and on about how to... Uh, work with contractors and get prices and and 
start building. She's had some very good success. She went from complete dead in the water three months ago uh, to now she just uh, is putting the finish touch, touches on her factory. Uh, the tea plantations were very interesting. I had no idea what we were going to find in Malawi, but up in the mountains had these huge fields of tea leaves. And uh, this picture shows them harvesting out there. Um, we stopped to take pictures, and that was a very interesting exchange because uh, uh, the women have a, a, a couldn't decide if it was a guard to keep them safe or a boss to make sure they didn't stop. Um, but he wasn't, wasn't going to let us take pictures unless we paid for it. And, and it was, of course, you know, almost nothing to pay. So. And of course, the big thing, and we got to go to one of the things there, hip, elephants, hippos, lions, didn't get, a, didn't get to see uh, rhinoceros. They were hiding, as was the giraffe that day. But, uh, you know, these, these are places, it's kind of like if you are in the U.S. and you're in New York, uh, what you find in kansas or some other places vastly different and i would liken that to um, uh, this trip to africa uh, the other place i've gone they tend to be heavily metropolitan um, for example in tunisia you know this it's just different than you go to malawi i mean you're about 10 feet outside of the city border it's it's a vastly different economy and people with vastly different issues um than what you'll see in our normal trips when we go visiting places. So, thank you, Brent. I'm comes. gonna, yeah, I'm gonna ask you the same question that I asked Rich. So, what really surprised you the most? Uh, I think you know we talked at the AOCS meeting. I think we we're expecting to get there and find out people that are really interested in, in uh, you know, how do we help feed people and. And that, that at the corporate level, because I actually got to talk to the owners of the company. Uh, no, they they want to know about making money. You know, that's what they're interested in. Uh, the only way this I think ends up helping the people is the fact that one it's a kind of an unexplored area for them, if you will, to produce food at a cost level that, that the uh, uh, financially strapped people can afford to pay for. You know, so they're willing to expand if they can do it, you know, and make money doing it, which means the processes they put in have to be very efficient and they can't afford to have losses, won't afford to have losses. So it is, it's kind of an indirect way of helping feed people. Um, you now, the other thing I thought was interesting was where the beans came from. So I saw a question from Ian, uh, you know, about are they grown there? And the reason I had never seen these places before is that USEC, which is United States Soybean Export Council, they only go to countries that import beans. So in Malawi, all their beans come locally. And uh, answer, the short answer to your question is yes, it certainly is a climate problem. If they have a dry year there, they just don't have any beans. Um, but otherwise, all the beans came from uh, Malawi or Mozambique or another country in that region. And yeah, but uh, it's still very interesting. So Malawian beans are very expensive because the government just set the price for it. It had nothing to do with what was going on. So they were incented to ship the beans in from another country and they were doing that, so. Yeah, that was a problem. I was there right before you were in the, the beans went from, uh, 10 kwacha to six, and then the government propped them up, I think, again at 10 and exported. Um, but um, yeah, there, a lot of guys are use local beans. Um, and the other thing I wanted to ask you, though, is a little bit different. And that's the same question uh, that I asked Rich. Did your experience change your thoughts about being a volunteer? Uh, well, I mean, this is what I like to do now. So, no, I to go help people that are seriously struggling. I mean, they, they have zero outside contact. They can't afford to go anywhere. Um, and again, I don't, don't lose a whole lot of love with bosses of the world, but people on the front lines it's, that are going through the same struggles I've gone through the last ever, uh, to be able to help them in some small ways uh, to understand their problems and find a better way so they don't blow up, I think is... You know, something that 
giving back to the industry in a small way, I guess. Absolutely. So, nope. Thank you very much. And I know you're also going to Madagascar uh, to help them later in the year and really excited about your and Rich both going there. Thank you. So we have one more speaker and uh, just to remind you, we will have a panel at the end where we'll answer all your questions. So thank you very much for putting them in the uh, question and answer um, section and uh, keep bringing them in and we will answer them. I would like to now introduce uh, Marietta, Marietta Eliata and Candidly, we have saved the best for last. Um, she will share program details, the foundation of the program, and how you can get involved. Mariata is the program manager and director for Farmer to Farmer in Southern Africa. Um, this is implemented by cult Cultivating New Frontiers in Agriculture. You've seen the acronym on the slides, CNFA. Mariata is talking to us from Lusaka, Zambia. So good evening, Mariata. And uh, you've worked in agricultural development for, I think, over 28 years. Um, anyway, Marietta, take it away and thank you. Very much. I just want to check that you can hear me and you can see the presentation. Everything looks great and you're sounding good. good. Thank you very much and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Rich and Brent, for those great presentations, but especially thank you for volunteering. Uh, I had a chance to travel a bit with Brent in Malawi, and it was really great to see him in the field. And, you know, going to these, you know, dairy plants, you know, milk processing plants, key uh, research unit, and always having something to contribute. So it was really just a wonderful chance to, to see him there. And uh, we are really excited about Rich now going to Madagascar next week. So uh, I will start uh, by, I will start, I will just talk a little bit about, uh, you know, why it is what we, that we also talk about farmer to farmer program when we talk about the processor to processor initiative. I talk a little bit why it is that the three of us, meaning AOCS, uh, Serbian Innovation Lab and CNFA, why it is that we are working together and how we are working together, what we have done until now, and how is it that you as an AOCS member can volunteer with us? And then finally some issues, how it is, some issues that what it is like to be a volunteer on the ground. So first about farmer to farmer, and in many ways, the processor to processor initiative is really embedded in the farmer to farmer program, which is a USA funded expert volunteer program that has been around since 1985 continuously. Its focus is on sustainable broad based agricultural economic growth and people to people diplomacy. And uh, what it does is that it sends volunteers from US uh, for short-term assignments, about two to four weeks, to work with different kinds of agricultural organizations. They might be businesses, producer organizations, schools, colleges, and uh, for, for these short periods. And our volunteers generally, just like Rich and Brent, have decades of experience in their fields, and they uh, have made amazing contributions, you know. And during this, since 1985, you know, Farmer to Farmer has implemented globally over 19,000 assignments. So we really are seeing just this amazing outpouring of volunteers and their technical expertise being shared in the developing countries. CNFA, I work for CNFA, which is Cultivating New Frontiers in Agriculture, which is based in Washington, D.C., it has been implementing farmer to farmer program over 30 years now, and we are currently implementing the program in Southern Africa, in five countries in Southern Africa, and also in the Eastern European country of Moldova. And we are expecting that by the end of September, we have, uh, we would have, uh, uh, we will uh, implement about 500 assignments in those countries during the five year period. So how is it that we went from farmer to farmer to processor to processor? 
And I think we have really complementary skills. Obviously, the AOCS members have this amazing expertise in processing, in oil seeds, things that are expertise that is really needed in our local countries and generally in Africa, as Annette was present. Soybean Innovation Lab knows everything about soybeans and has also contacts in Africa and researchers all around Africa. And CNFA, we have in the Farmer to Farmer program and beyond, we have country offices with staff that know the local agriculture, have partnerships within the countries, and also have the knowledge and skills to implement these farmer to farmer assignments. So when we put the three together, we really have the expertise, the knowledge on the ground, the networks, and then through the USAID funding for the Farmer to Farmer program, we do have the resources, the financial resources to be bringing in the volunteers uh, to our local countries. We mainly work with the large agro processors, as has been mentioned, and we really think that through them, we can really achieve this scale of impact. And why is it? I think this was discussed a little bit earlier already. Typically, these processors provide more profitable markets for smallholder mar farmers than the middlemen to whom smallholder farmers often have to send their products. But then these agro processors are also capable of producing better, more nutritious products that will be made widely available in uh, the country. So that, you know, as I think Brent was mentioning, in some ways that impact is indirect, but that impact definitely is there. These are some of the things that we have done in the, in the processor to processor initiative. And I think in many ways, things really started from that Soybean 360, which was an event organized uh, by AOCS and uh, Soybean Innovation Lab with some other partners, it was a 10-day virtual seminar for processors on better practices and innovations. We have also participated twice in AOCS's protein forum, and now we have had these two AOCS members uh, who have volunteered in Malawi and Mozambique. And then finally, uh, we have now new ones, already new assignments scheduled, you know, Richie's assignments starting next uh, uh, week will be the, the one that is uh, going to be uh, very, very soon. And uh, Rich already mentioned about Agribal, and it is you know, one of our kind of main partners. It's a, a processor that is starting oil seed processing in Madagascar. Up to now, they've been producing livestock feed uh, using imported soybeans, but now they are really promoting soybean cultivation in Madagascar and are starting this oil uh, processing. And they are really looking for us for the support uh, in initiating uh, that oil seed production. So how do you volunteer then? So Sorry. the first First step is if you are interested, please contact Annette or myself to discuss. We are always happy to organize a call. And we have both in person assignments and virtual opportunities available. You know, the assignments, we have one thing we have learned already is that often in agro processing, the assignments don't have to be as long as for some of the, for example, a small folder trainings that we are doing. So one week assignments might just work quite well. And uh, we use the USAID funds, as, uh, as I mentioned, we can use them for travel, uh, for lodging, and we also provide a Caribbean for the volunteer. Uh, I think Brent was mentioned already that, you know, because of USAID regulations, the travel has to be in economy class. So we, we, we cannot provide uh, first class or business class travel. Importantly, and I think both Rich and Brent mentioned about that, you know, the CNFA country teams are on the ground in all these countries where we work and also in DC. And they are there to 
organize all the logistics, the flights, lodging, local transportation, and uh, we provide uh, the volunteer with translators when needed. We provide the volunteers with phones, and we are always monitoring also the safety of the volunteers. So, for example, all the hotels where the volunteers stay have been already safety checked. And importantly, they are there, our country teams are there, they understand the environment, they know the environment, and they are available for you there if something were to happen. So uh, many of these themes about what agro processors currently are interested in, I think have been mentioned already. So one big issue is soy chunks or texturized soy protein, as it is called in the US. And, you know, it's becoming really a very important commodity in some of these countries in Southern Africa. For example, if you go to the supermarkets in, in Zambia, you will find different uh, processors, uh, products there. And it is something that's being used also in school feeding. But also many companies are looking our support for initiating operations. So I mentioned about Acribal. And also we have a company in Zambia that is just starting oil processing and is hoping that the AOCS members would be supported with them. Some important things, and I think, you know, this has also come up in Richie's and Brent's presentation, is that, you know, scope of work is only the beginning of the assignment. You, as AOCS members, you are the experts. When you walk into that, the processing facility, you will start seeing right away issues where you might be able to make a contribution in addition to those that have been outlined in the scope of work. And I think both of our volunteers really were great in that in the sense of really contributing to that company's company and trying to provide uh, recommendations that will make the operations more efficient, but also more safe. Um, and as Brent mentioned, you know, a lot of companies that are in need and, you know, often I think we tend to think that, you know, it is the narrow expertise only that can be contributed, but like in Brent's case, just this amazing knowledge he has of different kinds of equipment really benefited other companies also. So, and then finally, you know, it doesn't all have to be agro processing. So we are happy to look for opportunities for you to give presentations in colleges, schools, churches, or US embassy events. Usually your weekends are free. So it's a chance to visit uh, touristic sites or markets. And then finally, you can also always take personal days either before or after the assignment. So there's a lot to see and a lot to explore in the countries where we work. They are beautiful countries. And we also hope that you will get to know the countries and their people while you are there. So welcome to Processor to Processor Initiative, AOCS members. Thank you very much. Feel free to contact Annette or myself if you are interested. Thank you, Marietta, for walking us through the program. Um, so, couple quick questions and then we're going to open it up uh, to a, a quick panel because I know we're running a little bit late. So uh, Marietta, what happens if they if the volunteer has a problem in country? The volunteer can always reach our team. You know, we have teams in each of these countries. We have a country director, we have a coordinator. Usually then we have also an accountant and a driver. You will get to know all of them there. There's also a 24 hour kind of emergency line that you can contact. Uh, and uh, so, so you will have the means disposable to, to and, the, and the people to contact if there are any issues that will happen. Great, thank you. So now we'd like to open this up for questions. Could our... Um... Could our panel here? There we go. Thank you so much. So I see there's been some uh, questions in the Q&A section. I'll just read read some, some of these briefly because they've been um, answered in text. And um, let me see. One is about using soybeans. Uh, are they local? 
Um, and yes, they are local. That's part of the, well, about 40% are local, about 60% are imported per the processors. Um, and the Soybean Innovation Lab is working very, very hard to create new tropical varieties. We've been doing this, working on varieties for what I think eight years one, and um, have the Pan-African Variety Trials and Smart Farms, which are input omission trials. So the seeds are getting more available, certified seeds are getting more available. Does anyone else on the panel have any input to that? Imported means different things, right? So most countries we go to, they're importing from the US, Argentina, or Brazil. It, these people are importing from the country next to them. So they're still yeah. coming from Africa, even if they don't come from that particular country. Yeah, often you had a great slide, Brent. I think it was. I think it was your slide with all the rocks and such that are in the back of soybeans. So processors yeah. have have a lot of issues. Um, let me see what else is here. Uh, and, go and ahead. Ned, I, I would agree with Brent's observation. In fact, my experience in Mozambique was that that particular company wanted to encourage their farmers to start growing more soybeans because of, let's say, the vertical integration yeah. uh, aspect of um, how it impacts the economy there. It helps the farmer. It helps the processor who's then making the soy chunks, which goes back into the population, which helps improve the nutrition. It, it's just a, a cycle that actually can expand uh, on its uh, value. Just to add, to this uh, topic that I think uh, we have discussed this several times in other uh, instances, is that the, the processor knows the quality of the soybean they want. And that makes it the most important person to, to, pull, that, the, to pull that product that supply from farmers. So we, we have stressed several times of how we can engage those processors, train them. So actually they can tell the farmers what they expect. And yes, they don't expect rocks, but that's it's sometimes what the reality they have to deal with. But in 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 the in that in those cases, and it's not just for soybeans, for many other crops too, uh, there is opportunity there for the the expertise within this membership to bring those specific trainings to expand beyond just uh, uh, the, the the rocks into post harvest into mycotoxin contamination potentially into other uh, quality and safety issues that most of us here in the West benefit from and we don't think of. And most of the times it's an afterthought when we go into Sub-Saharan Africa, which I think Brent and, and Rich uh, alluded to. So I think there is opportunities. You know, as soon as you get there, you realize that you might have fixed one problem rather quickly, but then other 10 or 20 open up rather rather quickly too. And I think that's the, the, the value of, uh, the mindset of our membership is that we, we can address all of those problems and at, at, the, at the same time, and they're multiple. So thank you. Um, the uh, Elizabeth, thank you for your question. You asked what size processing uh, do, processors do we focus on? And we are trying to get to the larger processors in each country. And um, as Brent mentioned that, um, Yes, if a volunteer is there and there's opportunities to work with other processors, absolutely, we will do that. But our, we are also trying very hard to uh, make impact at scale. And the largest processors in the country, as Rich and uh, Brent alluded to, may be extremely small compared to the standards here in the United States. Um, let me see. I don't see any other. Let's see. Uh, one commented on the safety aspects of this, and yes. it is just completely different standard from what we're yeah. used to. Uh, when I first saw Rich's picture of the, of the sandals, I thought he was showing the, the uh, safety footwear for the plant. Uh, that's saw the same thing when I see where we go, right? Those guys can't afford boots, and the company's not going to pay for it. Most people don't have hard hats or safety glasses. Uh, the the uh, plant I went there for, they had shut their dust collecting system off, which was interesting. I mean, they were just, I mean, how those guys could breathe that crap without, you know, dying on the spot was interesting. But I, on the other hand, maybe they did just outside the plant. So, um, but yeah, the this, just different standards. And they, you know, you can talk about why do you need to do this? Why do you need to do that? And those guys had, Literally no idea about the 
long-term issues to their employees that they were, you know, put it by making them work in those conditions. So. Yeah. And Brett, your report was excellent on helping, uh, helping the processor understand how safety affected his bottom line on several aspects. And that was great. Your report is kind of the standard now that we share with people. Um, Ouch. <laughs> Thank, thanks ahead, a lot, Nat. Yours too. <laughs> you, you talked about different stuff. I'm just going to be quiet. I'm muting. Go ahead, Juan. Yeah, so, so expanding on the safety issue and the answer to the question about the larger processors, I think remember that um, we, we, we see other companies and we strive to inspire ourselves to, uh, to, to get there too. And the larger companies, middle-sized companies tend to have a little bit more of the chair on, on showing others how to do better businesses. And I think we learn from each other. And that, that allow us to expand uh, the uh, protocols and safety or the markets on soybeans or the type of innovations or products that can reach markets and populations in need faster. Uh, at, at, at most of the times we, we think that uh, uh, there is a lot of space at the bottom in terms of uh, helping addressing the needs of the very poor. And, and yes, USAID funding is being used to that too. But we argue that if we can bring, imagine bringing 40,000 farmers, there's 40,000 livelihoods improved if these uh, processors have a, a better chance at, at, at increasing their efficiencies, reducing their cost, and improving the livelihood of their employees too. So they start paying attention to the safety issues that Brent, uh, uh, occupational hazards that Brent was alluding to too. So, so there, there is a win-win situation here that through the innovation lab, through CNFA, through AOCS, we can, we can, we can go there faster. And I think the, the volunteers that we have in this membership can get us there uh, because we are candid, we are not, uh, we won't stop from speaking our minds, but we want to solve problems. And that's something that, that pragmatism is, is something that we appreciate. Thank you. Um, and, uh, yeah. I, I think that's accurate because they're not going to spend the money if they don't see a reason to do it. You know, they just, just were ignoring it. It's like, well, okay, but one of these days your plant's going to be about an inch tall and then you're not going to make any money. So, Go ahead, Mariata. Go ahead. So just to continue after Juan, that, you know, farmer to farmer continues to also support those farmers. For example, we had a series of trainings in uh, five countries of Southern Africa in soybean in November and December. And this was just before the production season started. And these were all smallholder farmers. And it was about how to produce, you know, high yields of good quality soybeans. So, so most of the farmer to farmer program does actually focus on the kind of smallholders and then small and medium enterprises. And this initiative is something that nicely also complements it because what we can do is then we can also work with those producers that are supplying those actual processors and helping them then produce the kind of quality that is necessary and also increase their yields. So I think there were a couple of other questions there. One was about the growing environment and whether it is just too uh, dry uh, well, for soy. Mariana, before you answer that question, my experience in Mozambique was different than perhaps Brent's. The experience I had with JFS was a company that truly was focused on how they could help their population. Because the manager made a point that if he cannot help his customers, then his customers could not help him. And, uh, and he really had, I thought, a, a forward thinking, um, interactive uh, you know, view on how his company should be run and, and how he should be a part of his uh, environment there. So I, I didn't get the sense that it was all about the bottom line with him. Uh, his bottom line was how can he help his farmers? Because as he helped his farmers, they would help him. So it was an entirely different, uh, uh, you know, uh, experience. Yes, and I think JFS has that reputation. It's been around for, I think, 120 years. 
and it stayed in Mozambique. It didn't close down even during this long civil war that was there. So it has that real engagement there. But, you know, in, uh, in you know, companies like where Brent was in uh, Blantyre in uh, Malawi, then are also connected to those small older farmers and eventually uh, are, are benefiting those, whether those are in Zambia or in, uh, in uh, Mozambique or then in, uh, in Malawi. Let me interrupt, Mariana, to answer a question that just came in. Um, Ahmed, thank you for the question. He is from Morocco. He uh, says thanks, which we certainly appreciate. And he would like to know if there's a volunteer program for PhD students. He's interested in plant-based protein. Uh, so, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to butcher your name. Um, but let me tell you, yes, you can certainly volunteer. You, we can do a one-on-one uh, -on -one volunteer uh, virtually, the travel aspect of this program because it's USAID funded is for USAID permanent, excuse me, for uh, US citizens and uh, permanent residents. And I'm sure Marietta will um, go further with that, but we can absolutely hook you up with a processor for a virtual assignment and we would love to do it. So please reach out to us. Marietta, can you talk a bit more about that or answer that question better than I did? I think you did a great job. So yes, yeah. So there are some restrictions in the in the farmer to farmer program. It is really a volunteer program for U.S. Uh, uh, citizens and permanent residents. But within the context of process of process, there are also other opportunities. You know, virtual opportunities also that can be organized. And uh, you know, and you know, one of the things I think to mention also is that our volunteers. You know, that time in the country might be quite short, but many of them actually continue that communication virtually and they continue to support the hosts. There are host organizations that contact the volunteers still years and years after the, uh, after the assignment and ask questions when there's something that they don't know how to do. And so it is, it's, you know, it can be really a start also for kind of a longer term support of a particular processor or in the context of farmer to farmer, different types of organizations. So thank you. So I think we've answered all of the questions. Um, team or audience, is there anything that we've missed? Let us know. There's the rainfall is the issue about rainfall? It's in the in the answered. I think so. It's yeah, another volunteer answered, but but rainfall um, certainly rainfall can be an issue, especially with climate change. That's why we're trying to introduce um, tropical soy, African soy, um, and and for some countries it's a bigger problem than others. For example, where we were in Western Kenya, it's bimodal rainfall, so the farmers have two seasons, which is great. Um, and for other countries, it's it's going to be more of a problem. There are some irrigated um, input emission trials and smart farms, but that's not the norm at all. So thank you, everyone. Um, I don't think there are any more questions. Amy, do you see any more questions? Um, I think they have all been answered and I will post those email addresses again. So if after the webinar, you do have questions or want to find out more information, you can have direct contacts. Thank you, Amy. And thank you, AOCS, for hosting this webinar. We so appreciate it. We sincerely appreciate being in Inform, and we are looking forward to seeing some of you at the annual meeting. But please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have a technical question or any kind of question. We'll also, we can forward it to Rich and Brendan and get it answered for you if we don't know. All right. Thank you.